This is Andrew Stotz, and we're talking about careers in finance. And I have Wim Steemers here with us today. So, Wim, maybe you can give us a little um, background on yourself. Tell us what you're doing. Just a little introduction. All right. Well, by way of introduction, hello, everybody. As Andrew said, my name is Wim Steemers. Um, I've been in, uh, in um, the equity markets for about 20 years uh, for, uh, for a long time as an equity analyst and currently as a portfolio manager. Worked for a number of different um, uh, institutions along the way, Alliance Bernstein in New York and London, uh, Macquarie Bank and Colonial First State in Sydney, and now uh, I work for a family office in Sydney called AL Capital. Uh, as uh, as one of their portfolio managers. Mm. Uh, prior, just just as an addition, so prior to my career in equity management, I, I had a career in management consulting, uh, which was very internationally focused. I was uh, based in Washington D.C. at that time, uh, but I worked all all around the world, which was which was a great actually uh, preparation for for later work in um, in equity markets. And I think that we first met when you were at Alliance Bernstein, and we met, I think, first time in New York, if I recall correctly. And uh, what, what I just, the, the thing that I remembered about you when we first met was that in some ways I felt like it was a kindred spirit in the sense that you were a very detailed guy yeah. looking at analysis of companies in the Alliance Bernstein way, and you were more of a buy side analyst versus me a sell side analyst but i i can very much remember you know that focus on details that focus on understanding and, and as i recall it was also banks that you right. knew a lot about yeah. so um tell us a little bit about like how you started in the equity analysis and what does right. it mean to be an analyst or that type of thing for a fund management company so, um, so it's interesting. Yes, you, you and I met. Indeed, I was in New York, um, and and as things go in in these buy side uh, companies, um, there's a team of analysts, and the analysts are sort of each given a sector. And it's actually very interesting. So, but as I said, prior to joining them, I I had a career in uh, consulting, and we did a lot of work in emerging markets. So we were. You know, we, we were working in China before, you know, a lot of American CEOs even had their first passport, right? I mean, you know, the, the Soviet Union broke apart. We did a lot of work in Russia in the 90s. You know, China was opening up. We did a lot of work in Brazil in the 90s. All these emerging markets started to, um, to, uh, to be looked at. So when I changed to, um, to, to work for Alliance Bernstein and they asked me, what do you want to cover? They gave me, I think it was two choices. One was you know, uh, like heavy machinery in the Midwest and the other one was banks in emerging markets. So I didn't, <laughs> didn't need to think about that for very long. Um, so that's, that's how you and I met. So you were covering the, the banks in, in Thailand and maybe a few other countries at the mm. time for ING, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, um, so Alliance Bernstein, or Bernstein at the time when I joined yeah. them was actually right before Alliance bought them. Uh, they were known and still are known today for an extreme focus on quantitative analysis. Right? So, so their philosophy was and, and has been and is um, the job of the analyst is to know more about the companies that he or she covers than anybody else in the market. If you can achieve that then you will have a better view of anybody else in the market, what the true value is. And therefore, and obviously you, you then take your positions. If the stock price is below the true value, you buy it. If not, you don't. And over time, as long as you have a betting average about 50%, you will make money, right? So that's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, you know, there's actually one, one more thing to it. So Bernstein also believes that the best, um, the, the best way to, to kind of pick these stocks is to look at what's called value stocks, right? So, uh, and, and that, that belief comes out of another fundamental belief, which is sort of mean reversion. So, so Bernstein will say, um, you see a stock with a 30% ROE, uh, 
you forecast that 30% ROE in perpetuity, then it may look like a good stock to buy, but we don't believe that that's possible. ROEs will eventually revert to the cost of capital. And therefore that, you know, 30% ROE stock where you're growing fast sort of by definition is a growth stock and we won't touch it. So the, the whole, the whole idea of being a value shop for them comes out of this belief of mean reversion over time, competition drives return to the cost of capital, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm just telling all of that to kind of give you an idea. That's where I learned my valuation, my approach to stock picking, et cetera, et cetera. That was the environment in which I worked. And I think, you know, personally, it was a very good environment to, to learn all those lessons. Right? So one of the um, questions I have is that, you know, when a young person goes into university, when they come into the valuation masterclass, as an example, it's like, okay, here's the formula and here's how we do it. And then they think, yeah, just buy below the, you know, intrinsic value. And, you know, it, in, in theory, it all sounds good, but in reality, there's many different challenges that you face and, and some things that, you know, for instance, maybe, maybe value doesn't work for a long period of time, or maybe there's other elements. I'm just curious if you could look back at those days and say, you know, after you've now been through so many years, what is it about those things that seem probably so crystal clear when you first started, like it all made sense that actually there's a lot more complexity even to that? Um, yeah, it's interesting, uh, how history repeats itself, right? I joined Bernstein in January of 2000, right? And maybe I was lucky timing for me. Maybe I'm just some, you know, puts who didn't really deserve the job. But at the time, Bernstein had trouble recruiting. Why? Because, you know, they didn't get it, right? This was the dot-com bubble. Mm. value stocks did not perform if you were buying you know old style you know you were buying supermarkets you just didn't get it it was all about eyeballs and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so Bernstein actually clients were withdrawing their money they were literally being accused you know their their returns were below market mm. had been for two or three years um, and the whole world was was telling them you know things have changed so I got into that environment. Of course, three months later, the NASDAQ peaked. And then, you know, Bernstein went on to have probably the, the next seven years, probably the best years in, in their history, right? So, um, so what, what part, part answer to your question is, um, well, uh, yes, there will be periods where things go one way, periods where things go another way. In the end, though, um, nothing really ever changes, right? <laughs> <laughs> like the fundamental forces of nature, right? They don't, they don't change. Now, the other thing, the other, the other kind of comment I would make in response to your question, when you, when you start, when you get into this field and you learn a lot of stuff kind of out of the textbooks or out of your valuation masterclass, um, those, the, the process you go through in that learning, um, more likely than not, will give you a, a warped sense of um, the certainty of the outcomes, right? Um, so, you know, you, you do your, you know, and I don't know what you're, what you're teaching your student, but it could be a DCF or it could be, you know, yep. anyway, it, whatever it is, it'll involve making some forecasts, right? And so you sit there behind your spreadsheet and you go like, uh, you know, revenues are going to go up by 5% and costs are going to go up by 4%. So the margin is going to expand for at least the next three or four years. And, you know, then it'll be steady, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you hardly ever stop and think about what's the uncertainty around those numbers, right? And therefore, it'll take you some time of you know doing a bunch of those and sticking with your calls and losing money on them before you realize you know at, at first you'll say yeah i got that wrong because you know this airplane crash happened and you know, nobody could have foreseen that but over time you learn you got it wrong because there's just randomness in the world and and that's something you gotta learn to live with mm. and and ultimately may you know maybe what ends up happening is you know, you, you kind of, in the end, you're, 
it sounds terrible, but uh, and I don't mean it to be, but you set your, you set your goals a little bit lower, a little bit more realistically. You know, when you start out, you think your job is to get every call right. It takes you some time to learn, no, that's not your job. Your mm. job is to get more right than wrong. But you, but you better be accepted for getting it. Uh, better be prepared for getting it wrong because that will happen. And in fact, you know, that's part of the job. If you never get it wrong, then you're probably not working hard enough and leaving money on the table. Right, right. right. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, what's changed? If we go back to those days where things are really crystal clear when we're when we're young and we're looking at the models and we're doing our forecast, we're calling the company, we've got all of our numbers together, we're talking to the analysts, we really are on top of things. Mm -hmm. And then we learn that, okay, there's so much more complexity out there. Just if we could look at, you know, WIM today in the way you look at investing compared to WIM, WIM back then of how you looked at it, what is the key difference about yourself today versus then? Um, I would, I, I would probably say a couple of things. I mean, for, first, what I said earlier, you you kind of uh, realize you don't have to get it all uh, uh, right all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the the other thing I think that changes over time as you mature in this job is, um, you you learn over time that the most important thing is not um, is not getting, I mean, it, 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 it's a condition to get your model right, get your spreadsheet right, to get your, to get your, your formulas right. And, you know, if margin goes up, the DCF should go up, not down. And, you know, that kind of stuff, right? That, but that's, that's sort of, the starting point over time you learn what is what is actually the most important thing is to understand what are the two or three questions that drive the investment case mm -hmm. and, um, and and it's interesting so what what that then over time will let you do actually interestingly enough is you can then actually simplify your models right so when I started out I still have, you know, hugely complicated models, a thousand lines and all the rest of it. But when I started out, I would, you know, you, you forecast a balance sheet, you know, you got your, you know, um, uh, receivables and, and, and your intangibles, this and that, and then there's other assets. And, you know, I started out doing every item on the balance sheet, you know, and what's the driver, should it scale with the balance sheet or should it scale with the revenues or should it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think it's a process you need to go through, by the way, mm -hmm. right? You need to do that. You need to understand that. But, but then, you know, over time you go like, you know what, like, whether I get these right or wrong, I'm not going to change my conclusion about this investment. So spending time on these 10 line items is a waste of my time. Right. right? Now I wouldn't recommend anybody to, you know, straight out of, out of, uh, training to take that approach because yep. the, you know you need you need to reach that level of maturity to know which are the ones you can drop yep um, but that's yep. you know that's the, the big difference between the beginning and the end of the journey I, th I think does it's that all make sense to you yeah <laughs> I, I think it uh, definitely makes sense I mean I I teach in the valuation masterclass about kind of the myth of precision you know, and balancing precision with simplicity and the idea that just being more precise doesn't make you more accurate. And therefore, in this day and age, we have to also think about the cost benefit and the cost of those massively detailed forecasts may not actually bring incremental benefit, as you've said. Right. And I think... Yeah. I think if, you, if I could describe what I'm doing in the Valuation Masterclass and what I'm doing generally in research now is I've created the value model, which is my standardized model that has everything in it. I never, ever create a model ever again. You know, I haven't <laughs> for years. There's one yeah. model. And then I ask the question, you know, how important is it to build a detailed, for instance, revenue forecast? 
Right. Or should I just use a 6% growth rate, you know, right. as an example? Yeah. The idea being that we want to standardize as much as we can about the model building so that we can free up time to do the real value added, which is trying to understand the randomness, the market, the people, the risks. Right. And then later, incrementally, as a position, as a stop may become a bigger position in the portfolio, say, okay, now it's time to dig deeper to understand the supply chain and how that impacts the gross margin and blah, blah, blah. But to start at that point where I started and you, know, you started, you know, to just go to all the detail, in this day and age when we're not really being paid much for that compared to the old days, mm. that standardization is part of what I'm trying to go to, to say, get the basics down, but understand how to scale the work that you're doing. Right, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, that's, that's very similar to, to what I'm saying. I, I guess, you know, I, I, my, my sense is there's a, there's sort of a rite of passage that you need to go through, um, you know, before you can kind of reach kind of the, the maturity to know what to drop and what to keep. Yep. Yep. So let's, um, for the average person listening to this, they're thinking about building their career. Um, I like to say that as a sell side analyst, you have to really be somewhat of a showman because you've <laughs> yes, got, yeah. you have to get the attention of the fund right. manager who's being bombarded, you know, and, and on the buy side, the fund manager side, you're being bombarded. Somehow we have to get your attention to read what we're saying and get the dialogue going. But I believe that that's not so critical in the sell side, or sorry, the buy side. So maybe you could just say, what are the things that, that, that are the, the skills that you need to be successful in buy side? Look, I, um, it, it actually varies quite a bit by institution, right? So uh, if you think of a company like Fidelity, uh, their model actually is, and I think, you know, people have described it to me this way. It's, it, it's a it's an internal sell side model, right? So, so there, the analyst actually write reports like a sell side analyst would, and then circulate those to the portfolio managers and knock on the door and say, "Did you see my report? I think we should buy this stock." And and it's and they're selling their report to the portfolio managers. Mm. Um, so that's kind of one extreme. Um, Bernstein would probably be at the other extreme. I mean, obviously, there's thousands of shops that I don't know how they work. But, but, at, but at Bernstein, um, I've never written a report per se. Um, what you would do is um, uh, you'd build the model and then you'd call a meeting with the chief investment officer and, the, and what was called the director of research for the relevant portfolios which may be more than one, right? So, mm. um, you know, a, a Chinese bank could go in the, in the, in the you know, global portfolio, the international portfolio, the emerging market portfolio, let's say. So there might be three customers for that bit of research. But you try to get them all in one meeting and then you go through your forecast. And the job at Bernstein then is to, to collectively arrive at what everybody agrees is the best possible forecast. Um, so that's a very different, mm. you know, so there's, there's, there's not so much a, you know, buy this stock, we have to, you know, there's like, let's sit around the table and look at my forecast. Can you shoot holes in it mm. or try to shoot holes in it? And, and can I convince you that my forecast is the right one? Uh, so that's a, so, so even within the buy side, you see how different, models can be right so yeah so my advice to your students would be you know ask yourself what kind of a person you are and then um and then and then tailor your job search accordingly right find out about the the the, the places that you're applying to how it works there and how would you differentiate the job of being an analyst on the buy side versus being a fund manager on the buy side um so, so, in, so most traditional um, uh, organizations would be organized uh, where um, you know, the fund manager has responsibility for taking the positions in the fund. So mm. I think portfolio manager is probably more, more used term than fund manager per se. 
a fund manager would be more the organization. The portfolio manager is the person or the role, right? Right. And and then you would have a team of analysts who would be responsible for stocks, uh, you know, be it a sector or some sectors or or whatever it may be, and they would then have a recommendation, you know, overweight, underweight, or buy, hold, sell, or whatever it is. Um, and, and there'll be a dialogue with the portfolio manager who will then kind of make that decision. So, so the, the responsibility of the analyst is the model, the forecast evaluation. The responsibility of the portfolio manager is to aggregate across the team of analysts um, all that input and translate it into portfolio positions. So what I always found interesting, and I've had numerous discussions along the way um, uh, and you know there's probably different ways of resolving this but you know I'm an analyst I do banks I say you know I've got 10 banks you know this is the most attractive this is the least attractive you know most overweight most underweight or you know long short whatever it may be but I cannot tell you whether my most attractive bank is actually more attractive than you know the least attractive healthcare stock, or whether my least attractive bank may be more attractive than the most attractive healthcare stock. Right? Mm. That is the responsibility of the portfolio manager, right? So it's a now, wider, it's a wider perspective, but less right, deep. Right. Exactly. Right. So the portfolio manager has to rely on other people, and then has to make a judgment you know, almost a judgment on the strength of the recommendation, the relative strength of the recommendation of two competing analysts, mm. so to speak, right? Got it. Um, now, how do I, you know, in my current job as portfolio manager, um, the way I'm, I'm implementing that, uh, and, you know, it won't work for every, for every situation. We run a, a very highly concentrated portfolio. I'm mm. only looking for, 10, 15 stocks, right? So very concentrated. And so what what I force my analysts to do is to put a target price on every stock. And then I say, okay, um, your target price uh, uh, compared to today's price, I add one year's worth of forecasted dividend. That's my expected one year return, you know, which is, course an approximation because it sort of assumes that you reach the target price 12 months from now which you know will never happen but mm. but kind of as a as a as a sorting mechanism that's my expected return now i sort all the stocks and so whether you know john's best uh, um healthcare stock is more attractive than jane's uh you know worst you know whatever consumer discretionary stock it'll show up in that ranking. Right? And then, and then I say, okay, and you know, we've decided this as a team, right? Um, by the way, I asked my analyst to put a conviction level, you know, one, two, three, high, medium, low, which is, so that, that forces them to think about, so the, the question that that's supposed to ask, to answer is, um, how what's your level of confidence in the target price that you just told me that you know how likely is it will reach the target price in 12 months yeah. mm. which is it's sort of like how many you know how many things can go wrong in your opinion right so we get so we get so so then so then i put together a matrix and i say okay expected return you know more than 15 15 to 25 more than 25 you know Conviction level one, two, three, that gives me nine boxes, and each of those nine boxes have a weight in the portfolio. Mm. Yeah. It's 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 as good a system as any, right. I think, but it but it is a way to get around that problem I was talking about for the portfolio manager to to weigh two different analyst recommendation against each other and do it in an objective manner, right? Because what you'll see um it, it, frequently and i've seen this in 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 my career um without something formal like that um you know whatever analyst is more liked or more trusted by the portfolio manager those stocks tend to 
tend to get a bigger position in a portfolio, right? Or the portfolio manager's own preference for tech over, over uh, um, you know, supermarkets kind of, it kind of creeps into the, into the portfolio. So you're using, Those are the, things you need you're to using the structure to try to reduce bias. Exactly. That's right. exactly right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just one, I wonder what is your, um, what is your understanding of risk nowadays compared to the way you thought of it, you know, many years in the past, like how, how do you define risk and, and, and how do you think about risks and how do you prepare for it or something like that? I'm just curious, what do you think about risk? Um, yeah, I, I always found risk a, a curious concept, right? So, so I, I did my MBA in the late eighties. Um, and these are the days of uh, CAPM and efficient markets. And so I was taught risk equals volatility. I was like, well, yes, okay. I understand like in a particular field of, uh, of endeavor, be it science, you know, physics, economics, you, know, you take words out of the everyday language and you assign them a special meaning within your field. And so we can do that in, in financial analysis. We can say, when you use the word risk, this is what you mean. But of course, in common language, risk doesn't mean volatility at all. Risk means, what's the probability I'm going to lose my money, right? So that's, I've always had this tension with that word. Um, and I tend, to, uh, I tend to still kind of think, think about risk a little bit more in the common language sense than in the financial textbook sense, to be honest, mm, right? Mm, mm. So, so, I, so I try to think about risk and what's my downside, right? So, so if I look at a stock um, and I do, you know, I, I, you, so if, if I want to look at like a, sh a shortcut, a snapshot, right? PE is one to look at. And I, you know, we can have a discussion about mm -hmm. the merits or lack thereof of PE as a, as a valuation technique. But, you know, if I look at, you know, five or 10 years worth of trading of a stock and it has traded in a PE band of, you know, 10% below the market, 10% above the market, right? So 0.9 to 1.1. And it is now at point nine. And then, you know, I'm contemplating taking a position. Let's think of it, what's my risk? Well, you know, yes, it can go down to point eight. It's never happened before. If that happens, I'll probably just buy some more. So not to worry about that bit of it. Uh, you know, the other element of PE, of course, is the, is the E. So let me think about how far can earnings drop? You know, well, you know, I've, I already have them, you know, not growing for the next three years. I'm below consensus. You know, maybe they could drop another 10%. You know, so that's the way I think about risk. Right. Got right. it. Okay. Um, so let's now um, wrap it up by just thinking about um, if you were a 20 something young person and you were starting your career right now. What area would you focus on? I don't, it could be by region, it could be by type of job, it could be, you know, what would be, do you think is an area that people should be looking at? Um, so it's, for whoever is watching this, uh, we have not prepared these questions, so I hadn't thought about this before. Um, look, let's be honest with each other. Our industry is in flux. Um, the sell side is hurting and, and my sense is that will continue to be the case. Uh, and this is in the context, um, I don't know if you talk to your students about this, but MIFID II, this European directive where mm. fund managers are no longer allowed to use commissions as a way to pay for sell side research. Therefore, they have to pay it out of their own pocket and therefore they consume less of it and therefore there's fewer dollars around. So. Um, a career in the sell side, I think I would be very careful with. I'd be probably hesitant. It mm -hmm. just doesn't look like that industry has got uh, a, a great a great future ahead. Um, now, look, it, it's not going to go away, right? So if you're the best of the best, then, you know, fine, by all means, right? Um, but 
you know, chances are, um, it's going to be harder there than than in other areas. It's a little bit like investing. Like it's it's better to invest in an industry that's rising than making right, money exactly. on an industry that's falling. Is you know can be done, but you're making it hard on yourself. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. Right. So now on the buy side, what the buy side's been struggling with, of course, the last ten years or so, is the um, this move towards passive, right? Which which has reduced the need for for active managers and it's putting pressure on their fees, by the way. Now, uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, on on that particular topic than perhaps a lot of other people. Mm. Um, So for a couple of reasons. Um, So so one reason is probably, you know, maybe the most important reason is um, active management has struggled for the last 10 years or so um, for one very simple reason, which is uh, stock markets have gone up pretty much in a straight line. And so therefore, um, passive investments have done very well. And by the way, that has all been because interest rates have been going down in that same straight line. Right? The next 10 years are going to look very different. Right? So the, the likelihood that active managers are going to prove their worth over the next 10 years, I think is much higher than, uh, than, than they've done over the last 10 years. Um, even if that argument weren't the case, there is this other argument which goes like this. Um, if the whole world would move to passive management, there is no longer any uh, price discovery. And stock prices will, by definition, get out of whack with reality. And just think about it this way, right? If we had that passive investment only for the last 20 years, you know, Kodak, you know, a company that's gone since then gone bankrupt, uh, would still be in the Dow Jones Industrial Index, right? Mm. Because the passive money would just never sell it, right? So, so, um, so, so if this move towards passive continues, all that means is that for the remaining active managers, the opportunity to outperform will just increase, 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 right? So, um, so, so on the buy side, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, than, than most people, you know, than, than a lot of other people would be. Um, so, so what do you do then? Um, I think there, there will be, there are, there will be opportunities in both large institutional investors as well as hedge funds. Um, and one thing that, that I find that people um, looking for a job in this industry often overlook, um, insurance firms. Uh, they will, you know, insurance and, and, and like pension funds. What we see in Australia, for example, is the, 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 what, what are called the super funds here in Australia. Um, they traditionally would have farmed out their 50 billion or $100 billion among 10 or 15 or 20 fund managers. They're taking more and more of that in-house, which is you know, bad for the fund managers, but it means mm. jobs are being created you know, within in-house. these funds, right? yep. in-house. Right? So, uh, and it's similar for big life insurers and, and, and what have you. So, so, so I guess the, you know, so, so the answer to your question, sell side, very difficult. Buy side, I'm not as pessimistic but broaden your horizon in, in terms of the type of company that will be looking for equity analysts. It's no longer just the traditional fund manager, Fidelity, Vanguard, et cetera. There are other institutions that will need those skills as well. And that's, that's a great wrap up. I think the other thing that I was just thinking about when you talked about a concentrated portfolio that you run, I think one of the things about the active or the, the passive coming on so strong is that, what we call closet indexers don't really have a place in right. the active. So actually it's pushed out a lot of those closet indexers. Mm-hmm. And then if you want to remain in the active space, you probably are going to be managing a more concentrated portfolio yeah. than if it was 20 years ago or something like that. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely true. And believe me, I've seen closet indexers 
um, I've seen my fair share of those. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll talk to you for just a, a moment after this, but I want to thank you for coming and, you know, sharing your experience. It's, uh, I'm sure it would be very valuable for the students. Uh, absolutely my pleasure. <laughs>